Battletech fans, it is, once again, that time of year, and you know by now what that means. That's right, it's time for us to take another little trip off the beaten path of what is and find ourselves treading down the road less traveled to seek answers to the question, what if? What if the stories told around the campfire are more than just stories? When the witching hour strikes, what if anything is possible? It's Halloween. Grab your lanterns and your spirit wards as we journey into the depths of Tuckdavian's Vault of Horror. The Rickety Ratchet Saloon, Solaris 7, 9th October, 3069. Back for some more, huh? Of course I recognize you. I know your type. Always got that hungry look in their eyes, hunting for fame, gold, or some other cursed thing. At some stage, a man's got to learn to be content with what he has, but... Oh, hell, look at me. What do I know about contentment? Seems that some years ago, a group of fellers just like yourself was in here going on and on about something or other called the Comstar Load. Seems this motley crew of ne'er do wells, misfits, and other outcasts got hold to what they thought was a bona fide treasure map. Looked an awful lot like the one you got there, kid. I gotta hand it to them. They spent the time, they did their due diligence. And after a while, 
couldn't wait to light a shuck for the periphery on some sort of clandestine crusade. They went out there looking for a prize, only I says I think they got more than what they bargained for, because as soon as that drop ship made Atmo, you could point to that very moment as the last time anyone ever saw the four of them alive, together or separate. They didn't exactly keep their intentions secret, mind you. You could hear them in here over glasses of beer loud enough to wake the dead, and I've swung my rod around here on Solaris long enough to know loud when I hear it. They were bound for the planet Pistol Lake, but it's since been renamed to something or other on account of wanting to keep these kind of yahoos from poking their heads around, traipsing through the grounds of the leisure destination and campsite where the prizes they were looking for was supposedly buried. Gold, Star League secrets, something more sinister, we'll never know. Only reason the story even got out at all to see the light of day is through whisper networks, people who claim they were there and heard the sounds of men screaming out in the woods. No one knows for sure. The only thing that is for sure is that they were never heard from again, and even the dropship captain has no knowledge of their existence. Or so he says. You'll see it in the dirt sheets round these parts every so often. Camp Pistol Lake found, the headlines will say. Of course, there's never anything anyone's got to show for all the claims, and any more of these back-alley spook stories are usually behind the latest warning that the incredible frog boy is on the loose again. That's how they get you. Yeah, I reckon I like that song and dance. It's a bedtime story I've heard before, and I know why you come round here telling it. Just to hear me say it's so. <laughs> Online. Accessing. Welcome back, Battletech fans. Let's have a look at tonight's game by the numbers. Accessing.
All right, Battletech fans, tonight our player embarks on a clandestine mission to raid a storied Comstar Depot hidden within the deep periphery. What the player does not know, however, is that astride the placid waters of Camp Pistol Lake lingers an enemy. An enemy who is prepared, an enemy who is dug in, and an enemy with spooky powers that will both disarm and dismember any who are foolish enough to trespass on the grounds of Camp Pistol Lake. Will the player make it out alive? Stay tuned. <laughs> A group of looters and other associated ne'er-do-wells descended upon the seemingly placid, peaceful campsite at Pistol Lake. The promise of a Comstar load was a temptation that proved too great to resist for hammer slammers, whether the contents were cash locations, state secrets, or ancient battle mechs. Curious, though, was the presence of a small battle mech at Lakeside. Could this be part of a security force meant to keep away any who may be on the grounds for ill-gotten gain? As they moved cautiously toward it, the dog-shaped battle mech took off like a shot and surged past the lake shore. Whatever it was, it wouldn't stop them from getting what they came for. The unidentified guard mech continued to zoom past the lake, and the slammer's commander, Stitch, had seen enough. Her faster lance mates would make a break for the bunks. She and her trusty lance mate Slapshot would put the dog out of its misery. In the Shadowhawk and Bushwhacker, respectively, Cobra and Winter reported unusual movements going on inside the woods, both to their south and northwest. Without a heat signature to verify the presence of anything outside of a large animal, Stitch dismissed the reports and told them to keep their attention laser-focused on the prize. Between her and Slapshot, they had the camp's sole guardian cornered, and she didn't want her team sleeping on the opportunity to move on the treasure unimpeded. They did as they were told, but the situation still somehow felt wrong to each of them. 
As soon as Stitch had gotten her target in sight, gun barrels flashed green and blue. Medium and large caliber lasers burnt into her guillotine's hide with a deadly accuracy that shocked her out of her complacency and caused her return reports to go wide. Stitch's startled yelp over the calms also shocked her teammates, and both Slapshot and Cobra came up empty. This only further heightened the sense of unease that was being felt amongst the Slammers, and while all eyes were on the mystery machine to the north, Winter's Shadowhawk lurched forward violently. An unknown assailant had burst forth from the woods and assaulted him. The damage was almost catastrophic, and the pair of Slammers knew it was time to bolt. In a blind terror, Winter took off as fast as his feet would carry him, and the same course of action made sense to Cobra as well. While this deadly dance was just beginning, Stitch and Slapshot were now locked into a shooting contest they could not get away from. Zipping past the Blackjack, the unknown guardian had made a beeline straight for Stitch, and her terror was nearly paralyzing. And that's when the situation went from bad to worse. Screaming over the comms came the voices of both Winter and Cobra, each reporting the appearance of a third mystery enemy in the forests to the northwest. On a plume of fire came the grotesque, gangly form of an enemy mech with a razor-sharp claw, the blade spinning faster than a top, and the weight of decision finally swung towards Stitch inside her guillotine. She fired her machine's jump jets and landed in a dense patch of woods. Because she couldn't stop the new enemy from getting where he wanted to go, but she could try to blast him off course. She set up a new attack vector that left Slapshot to deal with the dog, and the last glimpse of the machete-wielding assailant Stitch got was just before she landed, as it moved with demonic speed around the woods she inhabited and... disappeared. It, it, it just disappeared. It was there one second, and the next it was gone, a figment of a seemingly overactive imagination. There was no time to even process this turn of events, as Winter and Cobra were back on the comms again with new horrors to report. Autocannon shells, lasers, and missiles all flew out from their respective weapon ports and hit nothing but air. Their HUDs were experiencing some sort of malfunction, causing them to see multiple images of their target, and in the chaos, they'd lost track of anything resembling the original. Stitch's heart sank as her HUD experienced the same malfunction. Her strategy had been sacked, and she had no choice but to try and aid Slapshot in his dogfight. Between the two of them, they finally managed to lay some heat on their target, but the second she turned her attention, more disaster struck. One of the ghost images of their target blasted Cobra, and despite the missiles it sent going wide, the blast that did hit was unlike anything she'd ever seen. Not only did it melt her armor away under the tremendous heat, but some of that heat transferred inwardly to her machine as well. The enemy then reached in with its oscillating claw and sheared away all the armor on the center of the Bushwhacker's torso, and critical endoskeleton damage warnings came up over Cobra's HUD. Stitch took a hold of herself. 
there was still three of them and four slammers. She was confident she could overcome this issue and still get home with their prize in tow. The claw-toting enemy at least now had nowhere to run where it could escape from the slammers and it began to back off. But instead of heeding the order to regroup, Winter couldn't let this transgression against his teammate go. He blasted toward the gangly enemy, screaming obscenities as he went. Stitch now had a choice. Follow her own orders, or go pull her charges fat out of the fire. She made the difficult decision to join Winter as both Cobra and Slapshot vectored toward the retreating Hound Mech. Stitch was furious. She still had no line on the machete-holding mech from earlier, and she couldn't help but feel like she was being pulled into a trap despite having no choice. Regardless of her feelings, the slammers laid into their targets with the brunt of their weapons. Though their enemies also managed to land a few return reports during the exchange, the slammers really put the pepper where it needed to go. The claw-wielding machine wavered under the force of the attack from Winter and Stitch, but was eerily agile and managed to keep its footing. They just needed to continue these successes, and Stitch felt they'd soon overtake whatever it was that was here and giving her fits. Stitch was now content she had the situation well in hand. Running two-man teams, she and her lance mates had both managed to converge on their targets, and she leapt into a position for a killing blow against the claw-wielding machine she'd now come to have a vile disgust for. Her strategy was coming along well. Both Cobra and Slapshot had finally managed to corner the quickly backpedaling dog mech, and while it was trying to back out of the situation, Stitch was joined by a still irate Winter, and the two of them prepared to let the claw-holding bastard have it a second time. It was, alas, a pipe dream. Winter was again plagued by the HUD malfunction, and despite unleashing a powerful fusillade, failed to connect with nearly everything he threw at his enemy. Stitch only had slightly more luck, but still underperformed. Across the battlefield, Cobra and Slapshot were tearing the dog apart, blasting it left and right with heavy weapons fire with barely any resistance in turn. Despite the shoddy luck of Winter and Stitch, they still had their opponents in prime kill positions. That was, at least, until Cobra could have sworn she saw something flash out of the corner of her eye. This time, Cobra had no problems letting the team know what she thought she saw. This warning would prompt both Winter and Stitch to back off of their target, with their new vectors allowing them to respond quickly if there was indeed a new threat. Cobra smartly backed up closer to her teammates, and its eyes glowing red, the dog-looking mech followed. Both Slapshot and the claw-wielding mech made their respective plays, but it was Cobra's voice that stopped short in her throat as the machete-carrying assailant darted out of the trees, seeming to come from out of nowhere. Only Stitch could see the claw-wielding mech, and she was powerless to do anything to stop either of these nightmares from coming to pass. The sickening sounds of detonation carried across the battlefield as devastating explosions emanated from the reappeared machete mech, slamming into Slapshot's blackjack like an oncoming train. Nevertheless, he persisted. 
Despite this frightening display of power, he gritted his teeth and carved two major holes in his assailant with large lasers. He even remained conscious when a laser of the same caliber found itself dancing off of his cockpit glass and leaving his vision awash in light. While Slapshot's head spun, Cobra unleashed a torrent of autocannon fire on her target, deleting the dog mech with a shot to the exposed torso and tilting it backward for the last time. It offered only wild, splaying shots as it crashed to the dirt. Stitch had zero luck against the claw-holding mech, her HUD still showing multiple images of her target, and none of the ones she fired at were the correct one, leaving her to feel like their foothold had slipped away just as soon as they'd gotten it. Cobra couldn't believe her eyes. The dog-looking mech she'd just put down was writhing in the soil, and an ungodly howl could be heard from across the battlefield. Her heart was gripped with fear as the machine reshaped itself in an unholy display of grinding metal and a shower of sparks. When it finished, a whole new threat stood in her way. The full moon was out. The legends were true. The werewolf was upon them. The moonlight was upon them. The chilling fear of mystic, deadly danger penetrated their bones as they felt an unseen presence lurking. After a gruesome transformation, the werewolf stood before them. Its demonic eyes shone red against the moonlight, and they could feel the icy fingers of terror gripping their hearts as it bared its fangs. They were scared. They were alone. They were three million light years from home. The only question that would now need answered would be whether or not to flee the werewolf and his slashers, or to stand their ground and fight. The decision was unanimous. They would stand and fight. To the death, they said. To the death. They'd made their decision, and it was time to put up or shut up. Slapshot lit his jump jets away from the machete mech to draw it away from the main fracas, and if Stitch and Cobra could team up against the werewolf, they may be able to make some headway while Winter kept the claw-holding mech busy. With what they thought was a well-thought-out and well-executed plan in place, the werewolf made his play. On powerful hind legs, it blew past Stitch and situated itself directly in front of Cobra's bushwhacker, and before Stitch could react, the wolf was out of sight, and all she could hear were the cries of her lancemate as it charged towards her. Despite this, the slammers let the thunder roll. Slapshot stood up to the hatchet-wielding mech, and the two exchanged blows. He dodged the enemy's particle cannon, but could not avoid the large lasers, his erratic movement throwing off his aim and leaving him worse in the exchange that he gave. The terrifying machine raised its machete up high, and in one vicious swoop, Slapshot was gone. Across the battlefield, Cobra stared down the werewolf on her own. The monster tore into the bushwhacker with punishing fire, and with her unable to offer more than a pittance in return, the only success to which the slammers could lay claim was Winter had kept the claw-holding mech at bay, and seemed to be hitting harder where it mattered. Rock, rock. There's a drunk 
Stitch gathered her resolve. If the Slammers were going down, they weren't going down without a fight. And as Winter continued to harass the still retreating claw holder, Stitch and Cobra decided they'd get to work on the werewolf while they had the opportunity. The two of them flawlessly executed this plan, and it was then they realized they'd been led into a trap. The oil and coolant fluid still dripping off of the jagged machete it carried, Slapshot's killer burst forth from the mist and barreled toward Cobra with death as his intentions. Stitch's voice came in loud and clear over the calm lines. They'd kill these sons of bitches. That was all the prodding old man Winter needed. He lined up his crosshairs on his target, and with a grim determination, he squeezed the trigger. The shell from his auto cannon screamed straight toward the disgusting green glow of the claw holder's cockpit and slammed into the glass with jarring force, ripping the cockpit away and leaving the slasher slashed. Across the battlefield, Cobra and Stitch shared similar successes as Cobra deftly dodged the terrifying machete while still putting the hate on the werewolf. Joined in a covering action by Stitch, the two managed to fell the great beast and she felt the courage within her heart growing as the slammers had now very nearly evened the odds. Stitch ordered Winter to bring that head-hunting autocannon back up to their position to support the two of them, and she counted her blessings that the machete mech was backing off after its failure to obliterate Cobra in the same fashion as Slapshot. Despite their success, the werewolf was back on its feet, and together, the two horrific machines prepared for a bloodbath, whomever's blood that may be. Cobra and Stitch finally had set up their targets, and Winter thumbed the trigger for his autocannon to rain down slugs on whoever came into his sight when he joined his fellows. What his sight was filled with instead was his partners being gutted as the enemy tore into them with a withering burst that neither Cobra nor Stitch could ever hope to match. The two of them both continually pulled the trigger, leaving nothing back, but despite their death knells being ferocious in their own right, it wasn't enough to fell either of their opponents. Winter was frantically throwing his throttle in reverse. There was nothing to go back to now. It was, sadly, too late. Winter had thrown the Shadowhawk into a vector that would carry him as fast as possible away from the macabre massacre he'd just witnessed, but the enemies could not be lost. The retreating Shadowhawk could not take what they were ready to dish out, and it went down in a dark staccato of gunfire and explosions, the ruined carcass slamming into the dirt for the last time with a final thud. The grounds of Camp Pistol Lake were quiet once again. And now we bring you After the Action. All right, Battletech fans, it's After the Action time. You know how it is, you know how we do. Jeff! You got slashed. I did. <laughs> I, but, you know, it's Halloween, so I knew the odds would be stacked against me, but I thought I could, you know, I, I was I was trying my hardest. And you picked this for us, didn't you? Uh, the the player force? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I picked it. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
here's the thing. I want to put this over real fast before we get too far into this and I completely forget. I think that you are starting to kind of inch closer to maybe being able to finally win one of these because here's the deal, you just by yourself have done better than any of the other Halloween participants that we've had on the show, because think about it uh, year one, all the zombie mechs lived, nobody could touch them they just wrecked everybody uh, year two, it was the devil's mech and nobody won that game <laughs> and so, year three you took out Freddy, you took out Cujo like, mm -hmm. these are guys that, I mean, I expected Cujo to die. It, he kind of had to in order mm -hmm. for the Warwolf to come out. Right. But right. the mm -hmm. thing is, I didn't expect Freddy to go. Right. And I'll tell you, doing this, God, there was so much math. That's why some of my turns took so long, is I'm sitting here thinking, what? how much heat sinks do I have to shut off so I can make my TSM good? And what weapons do I have to fire to keep mm -hmm. that within the... But here's the thing. The second I got that TSM active, I only had one turn, which is where I jumped out and I was like, bzz, buzz saw the back of the bushwhacker. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you wouldn't touch the son of a bitch again. You wouldn't get anywhere near him with that claw. Not, not by choice. Why, why would I? Plus, I mean, you had uh, Jason and he was, you know, he was doing what he does with his machete. So it's like I, I wasn't going to run into both of your, you know, weaponized Max. No, I mean, that makes perfect sense, but at the same time, I'm, I'm more lamenting the fact that I did all this complicated, like, oh. mental math, and that it just never ended up being a thing after that, because, man, trying to manage that stealth armor with yeah. just basic heat sinkery yeah. was kind of... I See, I thought it would end up being more of a mitigating factor than it was, but really, the stealth armor on Freddy didn't do a whole heck of a lot for me. It was those ghost images that got gotcha. you. Right, right, definitely. I... I... And there were several turns there where if it hadn't been for the ghost image quirk, right. then you would have rolled exactly what you needed to hit. There were several there yeah. where you rolled like an eight where you right. only needed a nine, right? you know, plus one because right. you were in short range. But still, right. the ghost images did it to you. Yeah. Now, yep. let me ask you this. I know that every year we do this, the machines are, what, what shall we say, OP. Mm, but... Yeah. I still feel like with as good as you did between these guys, and you got to understand, like, I think you might have actually been able to do, do some significant damage to the Warwolf before the game was over if it hadn't been for that crazy headshot, blam, on, like, turn oh. number nine. Oh, yeah. Hitting yeah. the PPC right in the face, yeah. you know, uh, to, to Stitch. I mean, I mean, you can look at the the sheets for both those guys. They they were they they took a licking. I I mean, I I lost. Sure. I mean, but they did. I Jason wasn't hurt so bad, but the war wolf, like that one turn, you you managed to smack it for forty something damage. Yeah. And the turn before that, you hit it with a few things. You right. were internal on one of the torsos. Right. And then you knocked it over. Right. Which that was amazing. Like I say, I've never seen anybody do as well. Uh, during one of these Halloween games as you did. So let me ask you this. That being said, were there any points in time where you were playing this and these things were happening, like you blew up uh, Freddy or you knocked over the werewolf or something like that? Was there ever a time where you had the thought in your head, well, like, oh, man, maybe I might be able to pull this off. I had to give him a black eye. Did you ever stop and think about that? I, I thought I could. I, I really did, but... Just never happened. So. Do you think violating the basic rule of horror movie 101 and splitting the party was was what caused that to be such an issue? Uh, no. I mean, because e each mech, I mean, I, I was I was in pairs, so okay. I, it, w it wasn't like I had a mech all by himself. Right. You know, that I was always operating in pairs, so I always had a wingman. It just, you know, fell apart. So let me ask you this. What was your strategy going into this game? I think that, that, and I ask you this for a reason, because normally these, I want to start to say, are pretty predictable, and that's why I think you're starting to do so well, is it's usually a bunch of guys show up, they have no idea what's coming, and then all of a sudden, blah, 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 am, you know, some stuff jumps out. I think I'm going to have to readjust what I do for the next game so that it's not, you know, as similar to keep you guys guessing. But knowing that, you, you went into this and, and you did so well, what was your strategy going into it? 
Well, obviously in the first couple of turns, I have two mechs that are slow, four, four sixes, and two mechs you know, that have a, a bit of speed at, at five eight. I, I paired them up in, in that regard and was going to try to make it to these cabins over here by the lake. I just, I never even made it though. I never made it past this rock out clipping. <laughs> so, okay. We, we we just talked about Jason and the machete and all of that stuff, right? So let me ask you this. Like, never missed with that fucking thing. No, he did. He missed oh, the once, oh, remember? Yeah, remember, yeah, I, oh, I took right. a swing over here and right. I went, whoosh, yeah. yeah. But, okay, when you saw him over here and he just, boop, disappeared. First off, what like what are your, your reactions? Like, what are you thinking when you see something like that? He just disappeared. Right. And then I remember you asked me, what, what do you mean? As in, he's gone. You can't see him anymore. He's off the radar. You don't know where he is. It's like you, you, you panic. You, you worry about it. But, you know, you still have targets out there that you can see. And I can't you know really react to something that's not there so i just have to redouble efforts and go after the things that i can see yeah i i mean i can't really worry about it it's like it, it fucking sucks but it's like if i can't see them i can't see them i have to go with what i can see and did it at any point in time this this was a thing where you anticipated here he comes oh blam and there he was like or was that just a, oh, well, god dang it. All right. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so maybe that was a tad overpowered. But I always just like, well, Jason always just pops up. You never know where to expect him. It's like, wait, per- he's, he's behind me, isn't he? Yes. Oh, you know. Perfectly in theme. I mean, not, nothing wrong with with the with it being in, in theme or not in theme. That, that's for sure. Speaking about in theme. Tell me what you think of the paint jobs. I, I tried specifically to paint these guys like their namesake slashers. Like we got Freddy with the stripy sweater on. We got Jason with the hockey mask and the werewolf. And we got right. Cujo and, right. and, and all of that. Like what did you think about, oh, and, and I, especially with Jason having a little tree in front of him? Oh yeah, de- definitely. Su- superb touches. See, I just thought that was that would add a little bit more fun. Um when it came to Cujo, speaking as I'm looking right at him, uh, when it came to Cujo, turn it into the werewolf. I looked at it kind of just like, well, you know, the host always goes, well, I'm about to die, and so it's time for the werewolf to take over so he can use that supernatural crazy healing they always seem to have in these movies. And that was kind of like my werewolf of, uh, an American werewolf in London. Uh, tribute there. And then, of course, we had Friday the 13th, and we had uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Cujo. Mm -hmm. I thought that the horror icons that I picked for this were pretty good. Uh, And and the redesigns might have been maybe just a little... I don't think that Jason was actually all that broken. No, not not really. I mean, in in her sphere mech, I mean, it was was the machete. I mean... Yeah, that vibro blade is nasty. I mean that, that that that's what made made him. I mean, but his weapons weren't. What did you think about the whole M Pod gimmick? Because I know you'd never faced off against those before, like the exploding, you know, right. one shot LB fifteen X auto cannon, basically is what right. that is. Right. But yeah, two blasts of like fifteen pellets just coming off at you in the back with slap shot over here. Right. That that like sucked. I mean. Well, I mean, just what do you think of the weapon? It, it, it's good. I mean, I I I don't know how many. Uh, how much weight it takes to they're they're not but, super uh super heavy but i mean it, it's that definitely effective i mean it's a definitely effective one one shot weapon i mean certainly a lot better than a one one shot lrm rack and see for this with jason him being hidden i wanted to kind of throw you on your head there and be like i could take the predictable move which like i was just saying was go up through this little hogan's alley here but really because it was jason and i love jason and i wanted to do something cool i was like instead of being predictable let me go with the chaotic route here let me see if i can just take the long way home and have it be like one two turns and then on the third turn jack in the box and show up Right. And, and have you guessing, well, is he going this way? Is he going that way? At any point in time, did that ever mentally affect your game? Were you sitting there going like, you know, I'd like to make this move, but with me having no clue where Jason is, I'm kind of not hot for it. No, no. I, I, I it's like, it, d- disconcerting, but it's just like, beyond that, it's just like, I can't, I can't do anything with it. I mean, I just have to play with 
what I got. What did you think about the game board? It represented oh, oh, yeah. Camp Crystal Lake. Oh, de- definitely. Pistol Lake. <laughs> you want to hear my my stupid story about that. I went on Etsy and I bought these little miniature log cabins that were supposed to just dot the edge of the right. lake here and it was supposed to look like an actual like camp, you know? And it was supposed to get here just a couple of days before today when we were supposed to film and it post office just said, "Oh, it'll get there just uh just late." Mm-hmm. Any idea when? No. Mm -hmm. At some point, it'll get there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, great, this is a set piece that was like really going to be the just perfect little cherry on top touch to this board was to make it an actual like 80s Camp Crystal Lake replica, you know, but those didn't come. And I felt so stupid. I was like, I could have just gone to a store and bought a $20 set of Monopoly. Right. And then used the little houses right. from Monopoly and painted them brown and been like, right. I'll never, I don't, who plays Monopoly? And it's hey, just hey they, they got Stranger Things Monopoly. That I think we, we both love Stranger Things. Oh that, my gosh. <laughs> that, that you might want to pick that one up and play that, you know, once or twice. But I was like, I could have used the hotels or the little <laughs> houses as either big cabins or little cabins. And I'm like, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. Until the day of. Right. But here's what I will say that I'm satisfied with and very happy about. We've got the dense forests right. on all sides of the lake. We got right. a couple of bunks here. Yeah, I mean, they're war gaming buildings, but right. it was the closest I could get at the time. Right. And I was like, yeah, no, the actual like stuff was in this one right over here if you'd managed to get up oh, to it. Right. You just have to get over there. Right. And... I was kind of wondering if you would scan the other one first, but I made it so that one looked like crap and the other one looked decent to kind of make it obvious to you. So I, I, I really feel like the board represented pretty well what I wanted it to go for. Definitely, and, but I, I just never had had the option. Like, like I said, I never got past that you know that rock right there. So like that really didn't matter too much. I mean, there was a there was a pivotal moment, like right over here, in this little area here, where you were facing down Freddy, and you just had hella guns, man. You were like, daka daka daka, and even that weapon specialist uh, LB10X gimmick, like, wasn't helping you out because you yeah. were you only need five, and you're rolling like three, three, <laughs> four, two, yeah, yeah. four, and I'm yeah. like, bro, like, yeah, that, to, I, I felt so bad for you. <laughs> that, that that's die rolling. That, I, that, like, hey. I, I think maybe, you know, that might have swung things a little bit differently, but ultimately yeah. at the end, you killed him right. with a headshot. So you pulled right. off the classic, you know, Freddy's dead, you know, whoosh, right. decapitate the guy. Yeah. So you did that. How did that make you feel? I, I loved it. I, I think that, that was just perfect. Like the best thing I, I, I could do. You know? <laughs> Ten, 10 points of damage, you know, you only Crit get, to the you only, cockpit. You get one, one shot in there, and it's like, boom, you know, hit the sweet spot. I think we were just uh, looking at a thread on uh, either Classic Battletech or Battletech International the other day. Yeah, that, that w- it was, uh, I mean, some, somebody was just relaying, you know, war, war stories of, of a game, and somebody had a pristine Kingfisher, Clan Kingfisher assault mech. And, you know, you see the sheet. It's got 10 damage on it. The head. The cockpit. Game over. I feel like there was a decent amount of headshots in this game. I got you once with Jason right. against Slapshot. Right. And then you decapitated Freddy. Right. And then, like, the next turn, the Warwolf decapitated yeah. Stitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This, is the, this, this is another question I want to ask you. Um, with me introducing... Pilots that have names that have special abilities into this, did that make things any more flavorful for you, or did oh, that make it more oh, interesting? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. That, that I, I love doing that. Do love you like it. that kind of stuff? Oh yeah, yeah. Because I would and, be willing to do more of it in the future. I was just uh, unaware that that anybody here really dug it that much. Oh. But you like the SPAs? Is yeah, what you're trying to yeah, tell me. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, and I just thought it would be an interesting way because this, the, the past couple of times, I don't have any pilot information for those guys like the Devil's Mech game or right. the Zombie Mech game because I'm just like, eh, you know. But for a slasher movie, I felt like, well, you kind of have to know who the characters are. Right. They have to have a face. Like right. killing some nameless, faceless mook just doesn't hit. 
as much as, oh no, they got Stitch. <laughs> or like, oh, he's, oh geez, there goes Cobra, you know? All right, Battletech fans, that concludes this very special Halloween episode shot right here at the Eye of the Tiger Studios in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Folks, if you like what you've seen so far, do us a big favor. Hit that subscribe bell down there and turn on all notifications so you can find out exactly where Battlebound's going to turn up next. And we have a Patreon, folks. All kinds of fun behind-the-scenes goodies for you to check out right now, including the Vega campaign, audio from the main man text, early release dates, and so much more. Sign up for those benefits today and enjoy them tomorrow. We've had a great time right here today in Tulsa, Oklahoma with our featured player, the Jeffster. You all know him. You all love him. We're looking forward to seeing you next time out on the Space Lanes on Battlebound! Battle smash our like button and subscribe to our channel. Crowdfunding is when lots of people give you small amounts of money to help your passion project come to life.